In Los Angeles, a gang of bank robbers turn their guns on police. You know, his mindset was on killing us. Officers are pinned down in the kill zone by a hail of deadly bullets. So many people thought that that was their last day on Earth. As the number of wounded climbs, police risk their lives to rescue those trapped in the line of fire. We knew an officer had been shot. But he needed help, and he needed to be rescued. Police and rescue squads watch in horror as fellow officers lie bleeding. In down and out gun. They face terrible odds as they respond to a desperate cry, Officer Down. In any battle, victory or defeat is determined by strength. In the battle for our streets, the police count on the fact that they are stronger than the criminals. In most confrontations, when criminals realize they're facing overwhelming numbers, they do not resist. This is a story where they did. On February 28, 1997, just after 9 a.m., Officers Lauren Farrell and Mark Peterson were on routine patrol. They spotted a pair of gunmen entering a bank on Laurel Canyon Boulevard. Inside, the robbers directed everyone to lie down on the floor. Started shooting. All units officer needs help. Bank of America, Laurel Canyon, north of Kittredge. The shot fired. The officers advised caution. The suspects are in the bank. Do not approach the bank. The suspects are inside of the bank. It's a two eleven in progress. Laurel Canyon, north of Kittredge. The suspects are inside of the bank. The officers called for the backup units to surround the building. Hey, Bri, I want one unit on the north side. I want a unit on the south side, and I want a unit on the back. Lieutenant Nicholas Zingo was the acting commanding officer of patrol at the North Hollywood Division. My units were setting up around the bank and they were cordoning off the area in order to keep the public from traversing down the street. And shortly after arriving at the bank, when I heard the automatic gunfire, I realized, you know what? We're in deep trouble. These guys, they were armed with fully automatic weapons and I knew that we were outgunned. They wanted the place surrounded when the gunmen emerged. If the exits were covered, there'd be little chance for escape. Officers Victor Garcia and James Zaboravan were on patrol when they heard the call. Shots fired inside the bank. Detectives Terry Austin and John Krulak also responded to the call. They moved civilians from the parking lot across from the building. We had two other uniformed officers who had also come up to that location. One of them was armed with a shotgun. We went across the street and took up a position behind a kiosk, which is located directly across from La Laurel Canyon in the bank. W73, we got the front of the bank covered. We felt we had a pretty good uh, position at that point because we could observe the whole front of the bank. Unaware the police had surrounded the building, the gunmen inside continued to fire their weapons, terrifying their hostages. On the northwest corner from the bank, police officer Martin Whitfield and Sergeant Dean Haynes stopped traffic and established a position covering the northwest doors. So we had the, the street uh, completely shut off and we have a secure perimeter. Uh, people won't get in and also the suspects won't be able to get out. Three witnesses told Sergeant Dean Haynes they had seen the robbers enter the bank. L40, be advised, I got witnesses over here say there's possibly two or three suspects inside, possible AK-47s, or wearing ski masks and dark clothing. 
Witnesses at the location rises 2 to 3. Suspects inside the bank wearing ski masks and AK-47. The police continue to hear gunshots inside. Our concern then was that they, they could be in there uh, shooting some of the uh, customers. The gunman made it clear they were going to get the money or someone would die. 15 20 heavy ambulance respond to Victory and Laurel Canyon for standby. 15 L20 right here. Paramedics heard the call and moved in to assist. 20, what's the ATA air support? Air support's been notified. Uh, 30, uh, 20 seconds. Air support has a 20 second ETA. More shots are being fired. 15 L10 is right there to support the shots that have been fired and maintain their altitude until you get to see what's going on. Air unit, maintain your altitude. More shots are being fired from inside the bank. 15 L10, I'm requesting SWAT respond to this location, requesting ETA for SWAT. 15 L90, advise L10 that SWAT has been notified. We're communicating on the air, uh, notifying communications division that we need SWAT because they're the ones with the heavy duty weapons. Uh, to handle a situation like this. While the gunmen were inside, police were forced to play a waiting game. It looked like it was pretty much under control until the suspects came out of the bank and the lead suspect pointed in the direction of my black and white and braced himself. And I knew then he was going to start shooting. At 9.25 a.m., the first gunman appeared outside the bank's northwest door. The detectives and officers behind the flimsy locksmith kiosk needed to act fast before anyone was killed. But the shotgun blast from only 150 feet away simply bounced off the gunman. The officers scrambled for adequate cover. Stay down. The suspects are AK-47. Our officers stay down. Shots are being fired from AK-47. Lieutenant Zingo was getting reports from Officer Haynes at the scene. He was describing them as being uh, dressed in all dark clothing, that they were wearing bulletproof vests, and that the suspects were not going down after being hit with our bullets. No one was safe. The police realized they were outgunned by a weapon which could fire up to 600 rounds per minute. As Officer Zaborovan tried to protect the others hiding behind the kiosk, two bullets struck him in the lower back, just below his bulletproof vest. In that first minute, it was total chaos. Uh, after the rounds started coming through the back of the kiosk, uh, at that point it was preservation. You really don't have time to think about things like family or whether or not you're going to live or die. Uh, at that point you're just trying to get to some type of concealment to where you don't get shot. Sergeant Dean Haynes was intent on protecting the civilians crouching behind his car. There was no place for these people to go. So the only place to put them where it, was, it appeared relatively safe was as low as they could get down by the, the rear differential of the car. The car was shaking up and down. Uh, fluid was dropping out of the engine bay. Uh, glass flying. With automatic gunfire raining down around them, a woman and a man were hit by the gun. As Sergeant Haynes returned by, he was hit in the left shoulder. It, it felt like getting whacked with a board on, across my shoulder. The suspect just sprayed the whole area again, and I could, I could see those uh, poor civilians by my car being uh, struck by bullets. I could see bullets hitting in the road around me, and I also knew that if I stayed next to the car that this guy could get right on top of me before I could see him. I came up to shoot, and I saw he was changing his magazine, so I, I, I felt at that point the best thing I could do was to get away from the car and, and direct their fire towards another location just to get away from where the civilians were. It appeared the masked men had an ample supply of ammunition. They made no attempt to leave the area. If the gunman opened fire again, hopefully it would not be directed at the wounded civilians. With police neutralized, the gunman walked north towards the bank's parking lot. Officer Whitfield tried to run for cover, but he didn't make it. Officer Nito! 
Police dispatchers desperately tried to keep up with the calls for help. 9089, stand by. One suspect is still firing at the officers to the rear location. All officers stay down. One suspect is still firing at officers in the rear of the bank. If we can get a super gun to the former recovery unit and pick up this officer. They're requesting a supervisor to form a recovery unit to pick up the officer. 1540 and one other officer is down. We can help out here with the officers down. Yes, you better get an attack over here. Any unit know how many officers are down? We have one. More than one, more than one. In his second floor window of an office building overlooking the parking lot, Dr. Jorge Montez, a dentist, watched events unfold. Now, I couldn't believe it was actually happening. The bullets were shooting through the engine, the oil was coming out, and, and I'm seeing the two other officers uh, right in front of my office behind this car. There's blood on his face. The other has blood coming out of his back. The other one's holding his ankle, and there's blood coming from his ankle. Roger, what kind of rescue do you need for the officer? Ambulances arrived at the scene, but paramedics could not get to the wounded until the shooting stopped. Detective John Krulak knew help couldn't reach him. He had to find a way to get officers of Oravan to safety. The uniformed officer who was behind the vehicle with me was yelling that he had been hit by ricocheting bullets. I realized he was bleeding from his left side. I also at that time felt something strike my ankle. I started looking around for a location to uh, go for a little better position of cover. I could see in an office building. I decided we were gonna have to make a way to the building. Otherwise, our lives were definitely in danger staying where we were. I asked uh, the uniformed officer whether or not he was able to run. I looked at him, he advised me he was, told him we were gonna make a break for the building and I wanted him in front of me because I didn't know how seriously he was wounded and whether or not he was gonna make, be able to make that 30 foot run out to that building. We jumped up, started to run. I got behind him, grabbed onto his gun belt and we started running for the office. Zaboravan radioed to warn his partner, Victor Garcia, to seek cover. But before he could make a break for it, Officer Garcia was hit. Now we have an uh, officer down at the southwest corner of uh, Kendrick and Laurel Canyon. Uh, uh, one, one, the 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 suspect on the north side of the building is walking around like nothing. Two civilians and at least five officers were wounded. The suspects are behind the two white vehicles on the north side of the bank. A rescue attempt was needed, and soon. We've got several civilians here also. Requesting a supervisor to organize a unit to go in and get the officers. Dispatch officer Guadalupe de la Cruz realized one of her officers, Officer Whitfield, call sign 9L89, was in trouble and needed help. 9L89, 9L89, come in. He realized that no one was coming, that the situation was so out of control that he wasn't the only person out there. But I think, I'm assuming with his pain and his situation that he was in, he, he started to get afraid, and the tone in his voice started to change. Nobody was coming. Nobody was saying anything. Time was of the essence, and he was going to bleed to death. Outside a North Hollywood bank, helicopters circled. As two gunmen were locked in a deadly firefight with police. Five officers and two civilians lay wounded and bleeding in the street. SWAT teams had been called, but they had not yet arrived. Police were outgunned and were helpless to rescue the wounded. As the gunmen who robbed the bank continued to fire at anything that moved. 
they showed no sign of running out of ammunition. With automatic gunfire blazing, Officer Garcia struggled to remove his belt. He had been shot in his leg and arm and was trapped behind his patrol car. He used the belt as a tourniquet to stop the bleeding from his wounded leg. Detective Terry Austin was trying to help the officer and made a move to get to his position. As she crossed towards him, she was hit. At the dental office of Dr. Jorge Montes, two wounded officers sought cover in the dentist's hallway. He rushed to help them. Dr. Jorge Montes hoped he would have what he needed to treat them. Though not supplied for such trauma, Dr. Montes administered a local anesthetic used for dental procedures to try and numb the pain. There's a gash in the belt and a gash in his shirt. So I open up and there's like a seven inch gash, two inches wide and about two inches deep. And I was so scared at that point. The dentist could not do much for Detective Krulak's injury either. Dr. Montes thought that the metal protruding from his leg might be traversing a blood vessel or stuck in the bone marrow. Pulling it out could be life-threatening, so Dr. Montes left it alone. Outside the dentist's office, the gunman continued firing on police. The officers and innocent civilians lay injured and bleeding. They were trapped in deadly crossfire. As police helicopters circled the bank, the gunman took aim at them as well. Fifteen level ten, I'm requesting SWAT respond to this location. Requesting ETA for SWAT. Fifteen level ten, Roger on SWAT. Fifteen level ninety, advise L10 that SWAT has been notified. Fifteen level ten. SWAT was equipped with the automatic weapons and long-range rifles needed but they were at least 20 minutes away. They had to pack up all their equipment and make the long drive to North Hollywood. The officers trapped at the scene would have to follow protocol and wait for a SWAT team. They didn't have the firepower to confront the gunman on their own. Who do we have to go there? It's going to bring in Foothills Van Eyck Division. Let's give it in here. We don't have enough officers to handle this. We have an officer down, Victory, west of Laurel Canyon. He needs help. Code 3, he is passing out. West of the 170 freeway at Victory, the officer needs help immediately. De La Cruz called in additional units. Officer Todd Schmitz and his partner Anthony Kavuna took the call. So we just got off of the 170 freeway. We rolled down our windows and you could just hear the gunfire. It sounded like a war zone. And at this time we still didn't know where the bank was. So we just followed the noise of the gunfire and we got about two blocks away. We saw all these police cars parked everywhere. And at this point we knew that an officer had already been shot. We were trying to make our way towards him. He was fading and he needed help and he needed to be rescued. They were determined to get to the downed officer any way possible. You see people, civilians in the parking lot of the mini malls taking cover. You see officers taking cover. We didn't want the suspects knowing, hey, there's more officers coming in right over here. Let's fire over in this area. The dispatchers tried to keep up radio contact with Whitfield. He was in extreme pain and desperate for help. Need help. My concern then was that his injuries were severe enough to where uh, he was going to lose his life, and we had to. We had to get so, do something to get someone in there to, uh, to rescue him, and, and we, you couldn't bring an ambulance in there. 
Ambulances were poised outside the kill zone, ready to assist. They were forced to wait. The gunmen continued firing at the trapped officers as Schmitz and Kabuna moved towards Whitfield. Now we're directly across the street from the bank. We see a police car, a detective's car, and we see an officer who's been shot. And he's leaning backwards against the rear of a car, and we're trying to make our way up towards him, using all the vehicles as cover. And at this time, we're getting, I don't know if they're shooting at us, but they're shooting in the general vicinity of us. And you can hear the rounds hitting, ding, 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 as it's hitting cars, as it's hitting light poles right around you. You know it's coming from the bank, but you don't know how many suspects there are. All you know is that these guys got automatic weapons, and you cannot believe how many rounds are being fired. It's just nonstop. And what made it so dramatic, I think, is the big buildings, because it's the rounds echoing. So you got that multiplied by how many rounds are being shot. It's so loud. 99, 99, 99, come in. As they worked their way towards Whitney, they spotted Victor Garcia, another wounded officer. Schmitz's partner, Anthony Kabunik, was afraid for the officer's life. Once we had him in our sights, we wanted to get to him, render some type of aid, whether it's cover or get him out of there. Then we noticed that there was another female detective who was shot. At this time, it's so loud. My partner's one car away from me, and I can't hear what he's saying. And he's yelling at me, and he ended up yelling, go get a car, go get a car. All the police vehicles that were in the parking lot where the downed officers were, were all shot up already. They had blown out tires, and they were useless. So the closest car we could find is just south of the bank. Officer Schmitz had only been on the force for five months. He now had to make the most difficult decision of his career. To rescue the downed officers, he had to run back through the kill zone to get to the car. As I was leaving the cover of the parking lot, I knew that this had to be done. And if I run fast enough, these guys might not be able to get an aim on me. So I just took off running for dear life. At the north side of the bank, one of the gunmen laid down covering fire as his partner got into a white sedan. He carried a duffel bag stuffed with over $300,000. Police helicopters provided aerial surveillance and kept the gunmen in their sights. One suspect is in the white vehicle. The white vehicle is on the west side of, uh, of the bank. All officers stay down. One suspect is still firing at officers in the rear of the bank. One suspect has entered a white vehicle on the west side of the bank. The suspects appeared to be on the move. For Officer Schmitz, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to try to rescue the trapped officers. I don't even remember how I was driving because you're just so focused on your mission. You're focused on, I gotta get back in there as soon as possible to, to help these officers out. Officer Kabunik came behind the officer. Uh, the female detective, she opened up the rear car door. I grabbed the officer's legs and just flopped back into the rear seat with the downed officer on top of him, and we loaded him in. I ran back around into the driver's seat. I put the car in reverse. I drove as fast as I could because it's just no man's land out there. Schmitz backed the car up under a hail of gunfire. Come on, come on, let's go! Ambulances couldn't get near the scene itself, but a triage center had been set up two blocks away. Paramedics scrambled into action when they heard two wounded officers were on their way. One of the police officers, Victor Garcia, was critically injured. His only hope was emergency surgery to save his leg and his life. A second officer, Detective Terry Austin, sustained flesh wounds. She was treated at Tarzana Medical Center and released that same day. Victor Garcia was loaded into an ambulance and rushed to Providence Holy Cross Medical Center. 
Officer Schmitz and his partner knew more officers were down inside the kill zone. They had to go back in. Police in Los Angeles faced a growing crisis. Two heavily armed bank robbers had opened fire outside a North Hollywood bank. Civilians and police officers were critically wounded. Officer Victor Garcia had been shot twice. He was rescued and driven to safety by his fellow officers. Now he was en route to the hospital. As he went into shock, paramedics struggled to stabilize him. They started an IV to replace his fluids and bring up his blood pressure. Officer Garcia had sustained bullet wounds to the arm and leg. He had lost a great deal of blood. If they hoped to save his life, every second would count. Paramedics contacted the trauma staff at Providence Holy Cross Hospital to prepare them for Officer Garcia's arrival. Rescue 21 to Providence Holy Cross. The hospital began preparing a trauma room for Officer Garcia. Second, okay? They also got ready to treat additional wounded. Whitfield maintained radio contact with dispatcher Guadalupe de la Cruz. His voice started to change. He sounded afraid. He came in and he says, Ma'am, what's the ETA of my help? I'm not going to lie. I told him. 9A37, which was one of his units from his division, had told me he was responding. He couldn't tell me how far away he was. He told me he was coming. I said, okay, 9L89, 9A37 is coming. He's on his way. Officer down, that's the terminology, officer down. You know they're shot, you know they're hit. And it was just a lot of confusion because Everybody wanted to help. Officers want to help each other, just like firemen. They're brothers and sisters, and they're trying to go and protect their own. And it just made for massive pandemonium. And just trying to control that, listening to hundreds, literally, of officers talking, everybody had something to say, and everything that they said was important. Officer Whitfield had lost a lot of blood. Need help. He was fading fast. Unless he received medical treatment soon, he would die. <coughs> Officer Schmitz knew the downed man was running out of time. He and his partner, Anthony Kabunik, worked their way back through the kill zone. I wasn't sure how many times he was shot, but his voice on the radio was fading. It was, he was, please help, you know. Uh, this is 9L89. I need help. And each broadcast was getting slower and his voice was just fading. And we knew, we gotta go get him. I know 89, hang in there, 937 is almost there. The media had heard of the shootout on the police scanners. All of the major networks in Los Angeles sent reporters. The Spanish language channel Telemundo was one of the first on the scene. In a dentist's office across from the bank, Officer Zaboravan and Detective Trulak had both taken cover. Zaboravan was in extreme pain from a gunshot wound to his back. Dentist Jorge Montes was trying to help him in any way possible. So I'm trying to stop the bleeding. He's screaming, and the whole time he's, he has the police radio on, and you could hear the whole confusion of this whole area. It was a combat zone here. The senior officer, he had the shotgun waiting for anybody to come up those stairs. He had no idea what was going to come through that door because through the police radio, we were able to hear the gunmen are in the parking lot. At that point, we had no idea whether they're talking about the parking lot of the bank or the parking lot in front of our office. That's when the officer Whitfield on the radio, you could hear the commotion says, help me, help me. And the voice is going lower and lower and you hear other people, all these police codes and, and just, commotion. 
The gunfire was overwhelming and relentless. The slightest movement by officers prompted a hail of bullets. Despite the danger, Schmitz and Kabunik tried to make their way to Whitfield. Once again, they were pinned down and unable to move forward. At one point, I didn't hear him anymore, and that's when I panicked. I kept trying to raise him, and nobody would say anything. And I kept trying and trying and trying and nothing. Officer Todd Schmitz and his partner Anthony Kaboom had already tried to reach Whitfield once. They were beaten back by heavy gunfire. Now, they searched for a way to get to the downed officer. We ended up going one block north of the bank and we realized there's no way we're gonna get in here. There was so many rounds coming northbound that there was no way we were ever gonna get in there by running down Laurel Canyon. So we tried to take the alley, one west of Laurel Canyon. And the rounds were going through the alley. I mean, there was so much firepower and so many rounds being fired. We could not get to that downed officer. Another radio transmission came out that there was some injured officers in a dentist's office. When we were doing our original rescue, there was a dentist's office right behind us. So Tony looked at me and he's like, the dentist's office. So we run back into the original parking lot we were in to the same exact location that we did our first officer rescue. There's a dentist's office there. Officer Victor Garcia was taken by ambulance to Providence Holy Cross Medical Center. He was the first wounded officer rescued from the kill zone. The staff at Holy Cross was ready and waiting. They had enough capacity to treat up to 30 additional wounded. Dr. Insu Kim examined the police officer's leg. His fracture was really bad. It was shattered into many pieces. And I can see the uh, fragments of bullets, you know, mixed with the broken bones. If Garcia had sustained nerve damage, he could be disabled for life, or worse. Gunshot wounds of this magnitude sometimes require amputation. Dr. Kim would not know the extent of the damage until he got the officer into surgery. He feared the prognosis wouldn't be good. In Los Angeles, two gunmen battled police outside a bank. The officers were outgunned. Their adversaries carried automatic weapons and protected themselves with body armor. The firefight raged on. One gunman got into a getaway car. The other guarded the car. The weapon he carried worried Sergeant Dean Haynes. The first weapon he took out of the trunk of the car was an HK-91, uh, I think it is. It's a, a 308 caliber military assault weapon. It shoots a bigger round than the AK-47 and, and a more powerful round. It had double drum magazines. So I knew that he had a, a ton of bullets in that, in that gun. Sergeant Dean Hayes was wounded in the leg. Nearby, fellow officer Martin Whitfield was seriously wounded and unconscious. Haynes feared Whitfield might not make it. The downed officer wasn't moving at all, and, and I broadcast that we needed to get him rescued, and, and uh, he appeared to be unconscious. My concern then was that his injuries were severe enough to where uh, 
he was going to lose his life. And we had to, we had to get so, do something to get someone in there to uh, to rescue him. I didn't know. To me, it's like you know, he died. He died, and I really was the last person that he talked to. Officer Victor Garcia had been shot in the leg. He had been rescued from the kill zone and sent to Providence Holy Cross Medical Center. Dr. Insu Kim examined the officer's x-rays. The bullet had done major damage to Garcia's leg. You can see many broken fragments of the bone. Also, you can see major bullet fragments all spread around the area. So within 30 minutes, we moved the patient from the emergency room into surgery. During surgery, doctors would look for any evidence of damage to the nervous or circulatory systems. This type of injury can be extremely dangerous and does not show up on x-rays. By examining the size of the wound, the doctors determined the bullet entered at the front of the leg and exited through the back of the thigh. Dr. Kim had to remove as much of the debris as he could find without damaging crucial nerves. In a dental office across from the bank, Officer Zaborovan and Detective Krulak waited for help. There were still some uh, ricocheting rounds that were coming through the door where we had come through. You could hear the glass periodically falling out of the door, things hitting the door jam. Uniformed officers were able to work their way up through an entrance to the rear of the building and safely bring us down through the back. As the gun battle raged on, officers Schmitz and Kabuna could not make it to the intersection to rescue wounded officers and civilians. Instead, they transported officers of Oravan and Detective John Kulak to the triage area. James of Oravan would have to be placed face down on his stomach. Rescuers were concerned that if he lay on his back, the bullet lodged near his spine could move, damaging organs or even his spinal column. Paramedics established an IV line to pump him with fluids and prevent him from going into shock. Detective Krula had been shot in the ankle. Doctors determined that removing the shrapnel would do more damage than good. It was left inside, and he was released the same day from the hospital. Commander Nicholas Zingo still had some of his men injured and trapped in the field of fire. Some officers suggested commandeering an armored car. The officers piled in and headed into the kill zone. They hoped it would provide enough protection to safely rescue the wounded. Fortunately, some officers had the, uh, the sense of mind to commandeer an armored car uh, that was making a bank drop and uh, use, have that driver drive them into the, the danger zone to rescue that officer and the people trapped behind my car. And there were officers that, that piled out of the armored car. They pulled up to uh, my black and white, pulled those uh, injured civilians away from that car into the armored car. All officers stay down, shots are still being fired. All officers stay down, shots are still being fired. The wounded were bleeding and terrified but safe. Do we still have an officer down? Are there any outstanding officers down that haven't had SWAT or an RA? Behind me needs to be picked up. He's directly adjacent to the black vehicle parked in the number two lane. The armored car drove to the location of the downed officer. Martin Whitfield had been wounded in the leg. He had lost a considerable amount of blood and was now unconscious. They grabbed the officer, pulled him into the armored car, sped out uh, northbound on, on uh, Laurel Canyon to Van Owen to get him to the medical command post. 
All the civilians and Officer Martin Whitfield had been rescued. At the bank, the wounded had been cleared from the scene, and the gunmen were now on the move. What is the direction the suspects are going? Eventually, the suspect behind the wheel of the car started driving out of the bank parking lot. The suspect who was outside the car engaging us in a firefight didn't get in the car. We don't know why he didn't get in the car, but he followed the car through the parking lot to the street, continuing to engage us in a firefight. Police were concerned that if the suspects drove off and continued their shooting spree, more innocent people would be caught in the crossfire. The suspects escaped the perimeter. We've got one suspect driving the white vehicle. He's bound from the north parking lot. We've got one suspect on foot. The suspect on foot is behind a long uh, trailer, truck trailer rig. The officers shot out all the tires in the car, yet the gun continued to drive. Police were desperate to contain the men inside the perimeter. <laughs> Sit down at 10, if somebody has a shot, take it. Suspect head. One suspect is walking east of the bank. 15 L10 advised if someone has a shot, take it. The gunman who was on foot had his weapon jammed. He disposed of his gun behind a parked tractor trailer truck. He drew a 9mm pistol and continued firing at police. The suspect dropped his weapon. He bends down to pick that weapon up. And as he picks that weapon up, he discharges that weapon, shooting himself somewhere in the uh, head area. At that point, he goes down. One of the gunmen had taken his own life, but the other was fully armed and driving through residential neighborhoods. Police were in a desperate race to close down the streets before more people fell victim to his deadly fire. For nearly an hour, Los Angeles police and two heavily armed gunmen had been locked in a deadly battle. Police tried to contain them as they headed towards a group of homes. There he is. Does anybody have a clear shot of those guys? He better get the shot right back at. He continued to fire at police until his automatic weapon jammed. He threw it aside and reached for a pistol. Somebody has a shot. Take it. Suspect head. Before police could take the shot, the gunman ended the battle by shooting himself in the head. The second gunman continued to drive east, heading into residential neighborhoods. The SWAT team moved into position to try and stop the gunman, looking for any opportunity to take him out. Suspect is on Archwood. He is now eastbound, slow, on to the east of Beck. The suspect is on Archwood, Archwood, east of Lamp, going towards Beck. 15 U11, what is your location? He attempted to carjack a pickup truck. The driver got out and fled. Our unit reporting suspects are firing at civilians. The police were desperate to try and anticipate the gunman's next move. The suspect is now on Archwood between Radford and Hines. Civilians continued to drive by, oblivious to the danger. The gunman began unloading weapons from the trunk of his car and moving them over to the pickup truck. There's a suspect. 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 The driver took the keys when he fled. A group of SWAT team members drove a police cruiser right up to the brown pickup truck. The suspect opened fire. More shots are being fired. Shots are being fired. 15 out of 10. If he has to have a shot of the suspect, go for the legs. They don't have body armor on their legs. He was hit 29 times before surrendering. The gunman had held police at bay for 41 minutes and wounded eight people. One suspect on The man died of his wounds at the scene.
Both gunmen were now dead. But at the two area trauma centers, officers James Zaborovan and Martin Whitfield were still fighting their own battle. Two robbers had been killed, but police feared more gunmen were hiding inside the bank. There were 25 people inside when the robbers stormed in. The SWAT unit approached with caution, not certain what they might find inside. Anybody in there? The 25 bank employees and customers were locked inside the vault. SWAT! 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 When the gunman took over the bank, right. they ordered all the hostages inside. They're going slowly, very slowly. A quick-thinking manager locked the heavy steel door Here. behind them. No one had been seriously injured. Officer James Zaborovan had the bullet removed from his back. The operation was performed by Dr. Shaki Saad. And he was very lucky the bullet did not enter his um, abdominal cavity per se, so no major or vital structures were injured. I was very fortunate. I received two gunshot wounds. To, and they were mainly superficial, muscle, nerve, and tissue damage. Uh, nothing, no bone was involved. Surgeon successfully removed the bullet from Officer Martin Whitfield's thigh. During the operation, he lost a great deal of blood and three inches of his hip and femur. We went to see him at the hospital. And once I got there and I saw him and he gave me a big hug and it was like, this is a person. This is who I was talking to, not the unit designation that I was taught. You know, he was really hurt. Officer Victor Garcia's femur had been shattered by a gunman's bullet. After a long recovery, he was able to walk again, but he subsequently retired from the police force. It wasn't until after the gunfire stopped that officers like Todd Schmitz realized what they had survived. After this was all over, SWAT cleared the place, no other suspects, okay. Then we went into the grocery store like to get a drink or something. And then it finally hit me. It's like, oh my God. And you just start shaking and you're like, what just happened? Like, wow. You just can't explain how you feel after. That's when the fear hits you. That's when you just get overwhelmed with, what did we do? At autopsy, the gunmen were identified as Larry Phillips and Emil Matasarenu. The coroner determined that one of the gunmen had been shot 11 times and the other 29 times. They had both taken phenobarbital, which is used to calm the nerves. Veteran detective John Kulak is proud of the courage his men displayed. Now all of a sudden when you're confronted with people who basically outgun you, they have long rifles, they can reach you and you can't reach them. You go from being the hunter to the hunted. But I think on that day, somebody was looking out for us. I really do, because no one was killed. We had some injures, injuries, but no one died in that day. And I think, other than the two suspects, I think it was a good day for law enforcement. As a result of this incident, police in Los Angeles now carry urban police rifles in their patrol cars. It is not likely that they will be outgunned again. <laughs>